So I'm going to speak about uh, MD simulation of uh, fracture in amorphous lithiated silicon. This is ongoing research. We're working in uh, multi-scale mechanics modeling lab uh, with Bill Curtin as my advisor at EPFL. So why lithiated silicon? In lithium-ion batteries, currently we are using actually carbon as anode. But if you use silicon, it will have the highest known theoretical charge capacity. So we are interested in using this. But the problem is actually if you use if you use silicon and lithiate it, you will have huge volumetric expansion. It's 400 percent, and it will phase change actually to amorphous immediately. And this huge volumetric expansion will lead to crack initiation and crack prop propagation immediately. And after a few times of charging and discharging, the capacity fades and you, the battery will not work anymore. So we need to understand this. There are a few experimental st studies on, on, on understanding fracture properties of lithiated silicon. They're not direct measurement of fracture properties. For example, this one is actually measurement of uh, calculating the fracture properties Based on um, based on measurements of the fracture fractured surface of a thin film during discharging. So if you discharge the system, you will create tensile stresses, and the cracks will start uh, showing themselves. And then they calculated the, the fracture energy, and they saw almost constant fracture energy for different composition of lithium in these systems. Although there is another study which they have done nano indentation on this lithiated silicon system and uh, here first they didn't see any cracks starting after some composition of lithium so higher composition of lithium they don't see any crack so they call it high damage tolerance system and more than that the fracture energy actually increases with the amount of lithium in the system which is contradictory to this one so experimentally it's not very well known how it, wor it works forget about the mechanisms so the one way to go is actually to look at uh, to to do MD simulations and we did this so we did systematic MD simulations to measure K1C uh, in these systems we actually uh, created uh, we used mean potential for 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 this for this lithiated silicon and we uh, we put almost a million atom in a, in a cell to actually uh, do the simulations. We prepared the sample using melting and quenching methods, so we melt the system and then we quench it slowly to have an amorphous system of lithiated silicon. The boundary conditions that we applied is a K-field boundary condition here, but in order to, to be sure that the plastic zone size doesn't interact with the boundary, we actually did some simulations to find yield points and then calculated the plastic zone size and then we will be assured that this plastic zone size is not going to interact with the boundary anyway. So we'll have a pure K field and, and, and actually accurate K field boundary condition to study the system. So this is the R curve that we measured. Um, um, as you can see, we don't see really different um, K1C values for different compositions. And the value is more than experimental value, and we expect this because it's not easy to create a very good uh, amorphous MD system, and the yield stresses are higher than the experimental values anyways. But we can look into mechanisms here, and that's the good, the good thing about MD. And in almost all cases, we do see some voids created in front of the crack, and then coalescence afterwards, okay? So, the void spacing and the void size depends on the composition, but in almost all, all cases when we do have some sort of event of crack propagation, then we see some sort of void created and then coalescence. So, this is really like ductile, classical ductile fracture, right? So, uh, in classical ductile fracture, people consider uh, a, a system with some voids in it, and then they say, okay, the, if, if, you're, if you solve the, the elastoplastic system, the maximum stress happens uh, somewhere in front of the crack, and if this maximum stress happens to be uh, near the void, then the, the crack propagates. 
And then, using finite element simulations, they calculate the J1C value, and it, they show that it's proportional to sigma, sigma yield times the spacing of the voids. So we actually try to, to measure this alpha constant in our simulations, and we see that this alpha actually remains constant for different compositions. So this is also like Dr. Fracture, but we should have in mind that actually we didn't see, we didn't have any pre-existing void in the system. So that's a big question that we have here. These are just created voids after having some crack propagation. So uh, what we have done in order to study really how these voids are created and, and grown under different conditions is that actually we have, we have set up some, uh, some uh, uh, biaxial expansion tests. This is basically the same, the same stress state as in front of the crack, and and almost the same size of specimen as we can see here. So we have done this, and and in if if you look at the stress strain curves, we can see the uh, the onset of instability. So some point maybe starts here, they will grow, and then and then we will have a collapse in the system. So the void will grow and then the specimen will be collapsed. So the, the, the stress will be dropped dramatically. So we will have the failure point. Higher lithium concentration will result in lower amount of instability stress. But at the same time, we did see actually different spacing for higher spacing for higher amount of amount of lithium. So maybe these two mechanisms somehow actually compete to, uh, to control the fracture problem. So we can maybe say that the fracture of lithiated silicon is controlled based on the competition, bit, uh, competition of change of the composition and loading. This is one assumption. But still the problem is that we don't know anything about this spacing. This spacing is something that we saw after the fact, right? So we, we try to actually find voids in this biaxial expansion tests that we, that we did. So the way that we try to look and find voids here is that actually we, we, go, we went to the simulations and we, we um, just counted the number of neighbors that each atom can have. And if you count the number of neighbors, if there is an atom in the vicinity of a void, you should have less number of neighbors, right? And this is basically a histogram of the number of neighbors scaled with a strain because we didn't want to have the effect of a strain. And this is a logarithmic scale. And we can see for, for very small strains, we almost start to see some void nucleation. So we'll start to see some atoms with less number of neighbors. So maybe there are some voids here. And as we increase the strain, we will have more and more of them. So that means that here, already here for like, 5%, as we can see, 6% of the strain, we do have some voids. So that means that potential voids actually exist everywhere in this material, right? And they should only be activated. And this complicates things, right? Uh, according to the model that we have. So uh, let's put everything together. We have some potential voids. And uh, we do have a sharp crack in the beginning. It's not blunted, so the maximum stress is here. After some time, the maximum stress will be shifted a little bit. Then voids exist everywhere, so we can activate any of these. Then maybe one of them will be activated, and then we will have a void growth by time, and then it will actually create a, a coalescence will happen, and then crack will grow. But we do have actually more questions here than answers. Why? Because we know the maximum instability stress from the biaxial tests that we have done here, but we don't know anything about this x max parameter here, right? There are different uh, ways to go with this question and answer this question. One way is to basically fit this biaxial uh, stress strain curves to sort of some sort of um, ductile fracture, Gerson type, representative volume element, um, and find some sort of void fraction. And this void fraction will give us some sort of idea of spacing between these voids. This is one way to go. But 
but in these RVs, actually, this, the, 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 the response really depends on the, the, the distribution of the void in the system. This is, this is a problem. And more than that, we need a quality sense criteria. So we still don't know the, the real answer. But as I said, this is an ongoing research in this part. But actually, these materials are even more complicated than this. So they are acting they're acting in a state of charging and discharging. So we are charging them, we are discharging them. The, the question is that, does this charging and discharging also have some effects on the fracture of the system, okay? And uh, in order to answer this, we used a method to create some samples uh, which are look, looking like discharged samples. And we did it in, the, in a previous work. The way that we did it actually we, was that we took a sample which is relaxed, so we melted everything. We relaxed the amorphous system to a state which is relaxed to, our, to, to some extent. And we just deleted some lithium atom, and this process is going to actually simulate delithiation, to simulate discharging, some sort of, right? And we relaxed it a little bit because it will rearrange locally. But by this process, we're actually some sort of pouring some excess energy in the system. We are changing the structure of the system. And changing the structure of the system and, and pouring this, this excess energy will show its effect on this biaxial expansion tests that we have done. So void creation and nucleation as well. So here I'm showing uh, an spe a specimen which has been discharged from uh, x equal 1.5, so it is LIXI. <coughs> Li 1.5 Si 2 Li 0.5 Si, and I'm comparing it with some relaxed state, so not discharge the same, the same discharge as, as, as the real as the, as the real composition. And as you can see, uh, the amount of discharging actually will will have effect and will decrease the instability stress of the system. So discharging will also have effect. So I can say that the fracture of the fiated silicon is happening based on the competition, not only just because of change of composition and loading, but also state of charging and discharging. It discomplicates things, of course. And I would like to, to conclude here that, so the fracture of lithiated silicon is, uh, is, uh, is not very well understood experimentally. We have done careful systematic MD simulations to get some insights on the fracture and the mechanisms. Uh, void creation and nucle nucleation and coalescence is the main mechanism that we, we've observed. And we have done equally biaxial tests to see how these voids form and how do they grow, actually. And then we could say that based on the results that we've got here, we can say that the fracture is really a competition between the change of composition, loading, and the state of the charging in this charging. So, thank you very much. <laughs>